Good morning. There's a major disaster unfolding in Central Africa this morning. In Zaire, Tanzania, Burundi, and Uganda, millions of Rwandan refugees are fighting disease, dehydration, and starvation. International aid agencies are doing what they can, but logistics are limiting delivery of the massive amounts of goods that are desperately needed. Amid a continuing mass exodus from Rwanda, beleaguered aid workers say they can't meet demands, that it's impossible to even estimate the number of refugees who are dead or dying today, Wednesday, July the 20th. 1994. From NBC News, this is Today with Bryant Gumbel and Katie Couric, live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza. And good morning. Welcome to Today on this Wednesday morning. Terrible problems here on Earth. We're going to get caught up on those from Matt Lauer at the news desk. Hard to be upbeat after those pictures. Yeah. The, the magnitude of the problem is just an enormous. And it may only be getting worse. Matt's going to bring us up to speed on that. Then we're going to look to the heavens. That's right. Close up this morning, the moon landing. 25 years ago today, with much of the world watching, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin became the first men to set foot upon the moon. Here's a brief look back at how and why it happened. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. Ignition sequence start. Six. July 20th, 1969, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin became the first men to leave their footprints on the moon. Kennedy's goal was not born of scientific purpose as Armstrong stepped onto the dusty lunar surface. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. He was helping this country score a huge political win against the Russians. In April 1961, at the height of the Cold War, a Soviet cosmonaut orbited the globe. The Kennedy administration realized it was critical for the U.S. to show the flag in outer space because America needed to reassert its superiority in the eyes of the world. But politics were forgotten as the live human drama of attempting to land on the moon unfolded. A half billion people around the world were spellbound for five days as the Apollo 11 crew of Armstrong, Aldrin, and Michael Collins blasted off from Cape Kennedy and rocketed 250,000 miles away from Earth. It was stunning. Grainy, eerie, shadowy pictures were sent back from space as a lunar module eagle neared the moon's mountainous surface. Armstrong had to guide the craft toward a level landing area. With only 20 seconds of fuel left, the craft touched down. The eagle has landed. Roger, Twain. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. The goal John Kennedy set for the nation eight years earlier was now a reality. Armstrong and Aldrin stayed on the moon's surface for a little more than two and a half hours. They gathered rock samples, planted a flag, and in the process, changed our universe forever. This morning, a quarter century after his, his historic landing, Buzz Aldrin is in Washington at the Smithsonian's Air and Space Museum. We should note that he's standing in front of a lunar lander similar to the one that took him to the lunar surface. This one was a backup to the Eagle, which was jettisoned in space after he and Armstrong we're back aboard Columbia. Buzz Aldrin, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Katie. It's nice to be here in the Smithsonian. You know, the Apollo 11 mission uh, to successfully land a man on the moon and then bring him back to Earth was really risked the US, United States uh, prestige and international reputation. Did you realize just at the time just how much was at stake? Uh, perhaps we didn't. Uh, in retrospect, uh, I really think that, uh, that the Apollo 11 success convinced uh, the Soviet Empire that they could not keep up with the determined uh, U.S. response to a challenge and, and anything else. And I think it was the beginning of the crumbling apart. It was uh, further magnified by uh, uh, arms build-up and strategic defense. Did you personally at the time feel intense competition with the Russians in your own mind? We, we were really too busy and too excited and caught up in the challenges that uh, faced us. You know, John F. Kennedy's pledge to put a, a man on the moon was, was made in the early 60s, perhaps never predicting what a tumultuous decade it would turn out to be. How do you think the Apollo 11 mission unified Americans, unified this country? Well, uh, I think for a brief moment it brought everyone together uh, in a sense of sharing and participation. And I know now that I meet people and they say they, they really want to tell me where they were 
when we landed on the moon. And there's a value involved in millions and millions of people. And it really doesn't have that much to do with the cost. It's the value in changing human lives. And that, that was one of the purposes of Apollo 11. Are the memories still fresh for you a quarter of a century later? Well, they come back every five years when I, uh, when I get a chance to talk to you people. <laughs> what, what, what did it feel like for you to see the, the Earth from the surface of the moon? Well, it's a great majesty to look up in the velvet sky and to see the Earth with all of humanity uh, back there. And, and that's where home is. Uh, the moon was a magnificent uh, desolation, but home is, is where the heart is. It still moves you to talk about it, doesn't it? You were almost the first man on, on, on the moon, and yet Neil Armstrong was selected. How difficult was that for you to come just so close and to be number two? Well, it really wasn't uh, difficult at all. I, I feel I was rewarded for the successful spacewalks that I did in the Gemini program, and uh, somebody had to be first, and Neil was the one. He was the senior person. It was very logical, and uh, I just needed, uh, we just needed a decision, and it was made, and, uh, and uh, all of us were just so happy to carry out that uh, privileged mission. You did have some personal problems, I know, following uh, the mission, some problems with depression. You had uh, problems with alcoholism. Do you think those were, Buzz, a direct outgrowth of, of this experience or somehow this experience exacerbated those problems? Uh, no, I don't think so. If anything, it, uh, it advanced uh, the opportunity for me to come to grips with those challenges. And now with 15 years of sobriety, I'm a most creative person, more comfortable, and, uh, and a more sharing, and, uh, and I'm out uh, doing my thing for the future of the space program. I'm, I'm looking forward to the 50th anniversary, and we're going to celebrate that by humans on Mars. You know, but getting back to sort of the, the mission itself, though, all the attention and all the fanfare, all the parades, was there a sense, Buzz, gosh, how can I top this for you? Well, I think I'm topping it now. I have a wonderful life going around the world sharing with, uh, with other people and a lovely wife, and, uh, and, and I just uh, couldn't have things better. I, I'm so enriched by the whole experience. Uh, I'm writing a science fiction story now and just thrilled to pieces about uh, the opportunity to project how I think the next 15, 20 years ought to be. In fact, as we celebrate the, the silver anniversary of Apollo 11, many people feel as if the space program today has been abandoned. Having been a part of the program at perhaps its zenith, does it distress you to see this, the state of the U.S. space program today? Well, I think we'd all like to see uh, uh, things moving ahead a little bit faster. I think NASA has a real challenge and they're, they're doing a wonderful job, I think, coming to grips with a changing world situation. The, uh, the squeezing economic conditions, the uh, challenges of cooperation. Uh, I think we're going to see uh, a lot of things coming from Asia that, that may be uh, challenging us to keep up with, with them as they try and make use of uh, some of the former Russian technology that's available to them. And they could very well be the challenges of going back to the moon. Buzz Aldrin at the Air and Space Museum. Thanks so much for talking with us on the 25th anniversary of Apollo 11. Thank you. It's great to be here. In a moment, another moonwalker, astronaut Alan Shepard, and a prize-winning journalist who wrote about it, John Noble Wilford. But first, this is Today on NBC. We could walk forever, walking on the moon. Fly me to the moon, let me play. The moon landing was viewed as the ultimate triumph for the United States back during the Cold War. It was somehow seen as evidence that our system was somehow better than theirs. But that was back in 1969, and a lot has changed since then. Airmen from the planet Earth, first set foot upon the moon. July 1969, it became in peace for all mankind. America's victory, reaching the moon first, has never been equal. Neil Armstrong's steps for many will remain the most enduring image of the 20th century. The U.S. would follow Apollo 11 with five more missions to the moon, a few of which were memorable, like Apollo 14, when Commander Alan Shepard tested out his golf swing on the lunar surface in 71. But America's interest in space waned soon after that, and the Apollo program ended in 75. Civil unrest in Vietnam diverted people's attention, social programs diverted funding, and space became expendable. Nonetheless, NASA pushed hard for a space station and a reusable shuttle, which was sold as the solution to low-cost space.